can't always hear what happens um, up here in the chancel, but Marcy just said, I feel attacked. <laughs> so friends, all of us at some time have worried about something. I'm sure some of you are sitting in the pews or uh, watching from online worried about the 49ers today. But some of us have a special gift in the worrying department. Our brains just know how to plunge us deep into the depths of concern and all the possible threats and grievances we might one day encounter. My brain seems particularly adept at worrying. As I shared in my children's meditation, my worries began at an early age. In second grade, my pediatrician, who was a member of our Korean church community, diagnosed me at eight years old with a stomach ulcer due to stress. I was a latchkey kid, and many kids do fine with that. And for the most part, I did too. I didn't cry or complain about it. Instead, I just internalized all my fear and anxiety. I worried about losing my keys. I worried that I hadn't locked our front door. I worried about the kids who would tease me on the bus ride home. I worried. And I still worry, which to be honest, worries me. <laughs> Science, however, tells us that worry used to be a survival mechanism. James Clear, a behavioral psychologist and New York Times bestseller writes this. Thousands of years ago, when humans lived in an immediate return environment, stress and anxiety were useful emotions because they helped us take action in the face of immediate problems. For example, a lion appears across the plain. You feel stressed, you run away, and your stress is relieved. Or a storm rumbles in the distance, you worry about finding shelter, you find shelter, your anxiety is relieved. This is how our brains evolve to use worry, anxiety, and stress. Anxiety was an emotion that helped protect humans in an immediate return environment. It was built for solving short-term acute problems. There was no such thing as chronic stress because there aren't really chronic problems in an immediate return environment. But the problem is, we no longer live in that kind of environment. Our society has shifted predominantly to a delayed return environment, meaning that today we face different problems, problems that can rarely be solved right now in the present moment but our brains are still designed to value immediate returns. We are essentially walking around with the same hardware as our Paleolithic ancestors. That is the evolutionary history of anxiety. In short, humans worry because it's how we've been hardwired. It was once helpful to us, so we evolved to allow for it. But since our environment changed, this thing that was once helpful actually seems now to cause more harm than good. Amen. Now having all this scientific background doesn't necessarily stop me from worrying, but I do like knowing it because one, I can acknowledge how very normal and natural it is to worry, and two, because I can pretend that my incredible ability to worry means that I was once highly developed in the art of survival. <laughs> Knowing the science of it all, however, is not as helpful to me as it is knowing that Jesus himself talked about worry. Jesus knew that we would worry. Perhaps Jesus himself did some worrying as well. We hear that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. I wonder if that was filled with some worry. And he felt that our concerns were important enough to talk about and preach on. Later, his followers felt it important enough to record his words and include it in their shared resources about his life. There are many things that so-called Christians today find incredibly important to their faith that Jesus never even mentions. 
Our worries, however, were significant enough to Jesus that he lifts them up in this Sermon on the Mount. For me, and perhaps for you too, knowing that the creator of the universe, the Emmanuel, God with us, cared enough about me and my concerns to talk about them in his brief three years of ministry brings me comfort. God knows what it's like to worry because Jesus embodied this natural human instinct. And he encouraged us by saying, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. We've got enough troubles for today, amen? And we've got enough to sustain us for today. After all, this passage begins with the Lord's Prayer that says, Give us this day our daily bread, one day at a time, enough for this day. James Clear, in his article about the evolution of anxiety, continues by saying, one of the greatest sources of anxiety in a delayed return environment is the constant uncertainty. There is no guarantee that working hard in school will get you a job. There is no promise that investments will go up in the future. There is no assurance that going on a date will land you a soulmate. Living in a delayed return environment means you are surrounded by uncertainty. This uncertainty is what keeps nagging at us and taking up so much valuable headspace. So what can we do about it all? Luckily, there are um, many articles and suggestions and reports on how to help relieve our worry. For example, Roy Bennett suggests, instead of worrying about what you cannot control, shift your energy to what you can create. What can we make, do, or create to help allevi alleviate the things we worry about? How can we contribute or participate and make a difference so that our worry leads us to action rather than gets us stuck in fear. In our scripture passage for today, I find three ways we might abate our anxiety, and I'm gonna take them in reverse order, starting with the end of our passage and making our way up. The first is look to nature. In verses 26 through 29, Jesus says, consider the lilies of the field, look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Now I know with climate change and all that is happening on our planet, looking at nature can cause us to worry too. But going out into nature, allowing ourselves to bathe in God's creation, it can also ground us and connect us to live purposefully and with faith. Take a hike through the Presidio. Listen to the roar of the ocean. Dive into the sanctuary of trees that is mere woods. It is nearly impossible to miss God's presence so deeply woven into the fabric of creation. And for that moment, perhaps we release our worries and find ourselves completely present in that moment. The second is this, to store your treasure in heaven. Jesus says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The number one concern of most living people on earth today is money. And when we don't have enough to live on, that is an injustice that God despises and calls on us to correct. There are systemic and economic flaws in our society. 
that allow for huge wealth disparities, and we absolutely do have to address that. But many of us worry about not having enough when we have more than enough for today. Where are we putting our treasure? With whom are we putting our trust? Is it in God who is eternal, or is it in things and bank accounts here on earth that cannot be lasting? Once our treasures and what matters are stored with God, and not in what moth and rust can destroy, a great part of our worries will be laid at the feet of God. Now that doesn't mean we own nothing and save nothing, although for some it may look like that. The early church looked like that. But it does mean that our priorities and what matters most to us must be that which is eternal in the building up of God's kingdom rather than in the building up of wealth, in the investments of our love and compassion and time rather than just in our stocks or bonds. Store your treasure up in heaven. What we entrust to God is everlasting. And finally, pray. Our scripture passage today begins with a call to prayer, not to be seen as pious or holier than thou, but because prayer is a conversation with God where we are safe enough to share our worries and our concerns with the God who is faithful and promises to provide. Jesus says we don't need a lot of words. In fact, we don't even need all the right words. We just need hearts willing to connect with God and willing to entrust God with our very lives. Prayer opens our hearts, minds, and souls to receive God's love and to know that there is enough for today. Prayer allows us to honestly share that which concerns us and to give it to God knowing that there is little we can do to control it anyway. Prayer stills our lives for just a moment and reminds us that we are safe in the loving arms of God. And we are. Just as we are safe in the arms of God, we are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So we pray not just with our words, but with our very lives. As we go into the world, we offer a safe haven for all. This new year has already been filled with acts of violence in our nation that could make anyone worry. Two mass shootings just in our state of California, 39 total in this country, making it more mass shootings than years, than th this year than days brutal police beating in Memphis that killed a young man named Tyre Nichols. How can we not worry? Something is deeply wrong here. But if we allow our worry to spark our instincts for survival, perhaps we will realize that we need each other to survive that we do not survive on our own. And so the best way to relieve our worry is to care for one another and for the world, to go out and seek justice so that there can be peace. Amen. And we do this one day at a time, one person at a time, one moment at a time. Tomorrow, brings worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. So let us face today with courage and with hope, knowing that God is sovereign, so we do not have to be. This morning, sharing with us one way to care for one another with one meal at a time is John Knightley, sharing with the Interfaith Winter Shelter. John.